I'm not a professional. <laughs> I'll just tell you that much. I am not, definitely not an audiovisual professional. Okay, Coach, um, thanks for joining me today on this simple Coach to Coach interview. Really looking forward to it. Um, love speaking to new head coaches. So um, appreciate you taking the time. I know springtime tends to be a little bit crazy. So um, really, really, I'm thankful you took the time. Hey, uh, great to great to join you, Steve. Looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. Um, okay, so... You know, you were an assistant at Swarthmore, really successful program there. I mean, it's right, like easily one of the tops in the country, um, had a lot of success. And, you know, what, what's, what's been your soccer experience like and how did you end up as the head coach of Juniata? Yeah, so, you know, my, my coaching journey... Um, you know, first it, it began with kind of the, the playing career. Um, at some point, I, I think every coach is a little bit addicted to the game. Um, and, you know, had a, a fantastic just experience playing the game. Grew up in San Jose, California. Um, just absolutely loved, you know, my club experience. And, um you know, made the decision to go to Swarthmore College and play for Eric Wagner. Um, and, you know, it was part of one of his, he was, that was a rebuild at the time. You know, Swarthmore has, has come a long way under his leadership. But when he was recruiting me, you know, Swarthmore was a, a kind of a laughing stock in the Centennial Conference, always in not doing really well in, in the conference. And, you know, but he had a vision for the program and, you know, I got to be a part of the vision and um, had a great experience and just going through the process of really building a, a program and being part of that build and the momentum around that was just a pretty unique playing experience. And, um, and you know, I graduated uh, in 2009, so coming out in kind of the Great Recession, right? Mm -hmm. So sometimes I wonder, you know, would I have gone into this coaching route if there were like more traditional job opportunities out there? <laughs> um, but you know, I, I was a I was a coach in high school. I worked with youth players at the club. Um, I was a center back, in you know, positionally so sometimes taking on kind of that that coach on the field role mm -hmm. and and really you know I kind of got into it and pretty soon it got to the point where I just couldn't see another real career path absolutely kind of love mm -hmm. love the profession um so I got my start at Widener University under Brett Jaquette assisting there and um and then went back to the alma mater um got to work with Eric um, who was a fantastic mentor for me. And, you know, in all honesty, I was really happy where I was. I was an executive director of a nonprofit, coaching at Swarthmore, um, having a big role to play there. And so I was in a position where I got to be really selective and choosy about what jobs um, I was interested in. And I think I only applied for three head coach roles throughout my my coaching career juniata being the third and what really drew me to the position was analyzing i think there's there's real opportunity at the division three level where there's a mismatch between the academic standing of a school and the academic outcomes of the school with athletic performance and in looking at juniata i saw a job where this was a really good school with, you know, probably not heard of widely, um, but a really good school with really good outcomes. And, you know, the athletic performance hadn't kind of matched the outcomes in the academic mm -hmm. realm in men's soccer. Um, and yeah, just saw the opportunity to, you know, not just coach a team, but to build a program at Juniata. So that's mm -hmm. kind of what brought me to the area. Yeah. 
That's interesting that you say that because I have a one of my many pet theories was, is if a school like Messiah can win 11 national championships, most other schools can as well. It just the combination of things, right? Like it just requires the right combination, the right leadership. And that's interesting that you talk about a mismatch because I do that. That's very, very. I I do think that quite a bit. Like if a player is going to land at Division three, there's got to be certain things that align, and there's no reason why the academics can't align with the act. The excuse me, the athletics can't align with with the success of the academics. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, the, it, what what sort of experiences has at Swarthmore that you're, you're talking about building a program? I'm a big fan of that. Like, that's probably the thing that I like the most, right? Especially being in the corporate world. It's a lot more fun to build something than, than destroy something. But um, yeah. although it's easier to destroy than it is <laughs> <Yeah>. to build. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, what what are some of the things that you that you experience as sophomore, either as a player or as a as a coach, that you're you're looking to bring into your program as you build it out? Yeah, no, I great question, um, and yeah, you know, as a as a player, what kind of really stood out to me was you know, as we really got cooking as a program, like Eric was a fantastic recruiter and each year he was bringing in, you know, talented players that, you know, fit the school kind of, kind of fit the vision of the program. So when we, we've been at our best, um, when we were at our best at, at Swarthmore, it, you know, you know, you could talk about competition, right? You could talk about it as a core value and you definitely need to talk about it and define it. But it's one thing to talk about it. And it's another thing, like I remember just being a player and, you know, being a starter as a center back and, you know, looking at the guys that I was competing with on a day in, day in, or day in, day out basis and just recognizing how good they were. And, um, that, you know, they were hungry, they're ambitious, they wanted playing time. And so being able to balance in, in the way we balanced it was just having a compete with mindset, not a compete against, but really kind of like, let's push each other in training. But, you know, I, I think that's what it takes is, um, to really climb the mountain in division three Mm -hmm. is, you know, stacking recruiting classes, bringing in talented players that are aligned kind of with the vision and clearly communicating the vision. And then you have that naturally, right? There, Mm -hmm. there is no kind of room for complacency in training when everyone is pushing and, and there isn't much drop off, but you know, like I had a pretty good career. I was all region, a player um but i kept an all-american on the bench you know i I kept another all-region center back on the bench and i and maybe they would say something different but you know i i think that kind of helped their journey as players um Mm -hmm. to to have to really really get to a a super high level to then kind of get that starting spot um it, it really helped their development um so you know, uh, Eric, you know, I learned from him that like as coaches, yeah, we're important. We articulate the vision. We, we build the community around the team, um, with alumni engagement, with family engagement, uh, but I really learned from him, you know, probably 80% of the job is recruiting. And if you're not about recruiting, you're not going to be a successful, you need to like fall in love with the process of recruiting. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I definitely kind of took that with me. And I, I think the other thing that I, I really admire in Eric is the respect. Um, he just, you know, he treats every prospect the same. He treats everyone with, with respect. Um, 
and you know he doesn't cut corners and he went about things the right way um mm -hmm. you know focused on core values and and I, I, that kind of value-based culture is something that um definitely kind of took with me to, mm -hmm. to juniata as well are you are you starting from zero like are you starting from scratch or is that the way you're approaching it or are there things there that the program already has had what have you that are in place that you're like oh, no that's i'm gonna leave that or are you just going in and be like we're starting from zero yeah and yeah, great, great question. You know, and I, I got the job at a unique time. I got the job February 2020, right, mm -hmm. right before the world changed, right. And, mm -hmm. um, so I was one of those like new COVID coaches, <laughs> and mm -hmm. and and what that really allowed us was uh, the benefit, I guess, of being sent home. You know, March of 2020 was, you know it kind of forced a real um, time period where we were like, that's what we were doing is we we're talking about mm -hmm. culture. We were, and mm -hmm. um, the first thing that I did was to try to get the lay of the land. Um, you know, one in the team meeting, it was whenever you're taking over a role, you got to acknowledge like the elephant in the room that, you know, an important relationship in, the players' lives had gotten cut short, right? And mm -hmm. kind of acknowledging that and owning that and, and knowing that it would take time for me to build relationships with the players. Um, but we did a lot of, when I took over, thinking back on it now, did a lot of like individual meetings where mm -hmm. I think my job was to listen and to assess a lot of conversation with other coaches in the department, the strength and conditioning coach to really kind of get a sense of the guys. And, and what was great is, yeah, we weren't starting from scratch. Like the the values within the team that kept on coming up, just set in different ways, but coming up was there was a strong sense of brotherhood, a, a mm -hmm. strong sense of togetherness in the group. And, you know, like a, a good work ethic, like, you know, I call it passion, but like a good work ethic toward the game, towards the things you need to be doing out of season to, to develop. Um, but then, you know, you you have to lead with your vision right and um the competition the competitive element I, I got a sense early on that maybe maybe sometimes in the in the group you know getting along kind of got in the way of getting better mm -hmm. that you know there sometimes like the training and and just approaching games in a tough conference they're there was a sense of acquiescence. Um, there wasn't a competitive snarl to uh, the performances. And, and for me, that comes from training. So mm -hmm. um, we focused a lot on like kind of what we, what we meant by competition. Uh, for me, competition, the highest definition of it is to never come second best to ourselves, mm -hmm. right? It kind of focusing in on the individual development. Um, but to do that, yeah, we got to compete with each other. Like <laughs> at times it's going to be, and we'll, when we talk about if we actually really have strong relationships, if we're actually about the core value of brotherhood and putting the team first, then yeah, the strength of our relationships will sustain the intensity of mm -hmm. being in kind of a high performance environment. Like we could really push each other. Sometimes we're going to be angry with each other. Sometimes we're going to cross the line in training but you know we'll address that we'll bring it back from the edge mm -hmm. um but we won't fracture as long as our our relationships are strong and we mm -hmm. we kind of leave things on the field so um i had a real kind of strong focus on competition and then the other core value that i kind of brought with me to try to like you know help the team go up the mountain was toughness and we often think of toughness as, you know, what we bench, right? Or can I put someone on the ground, right? For me, toughness is really like a simple definition is staying dialed in, staying, staying focused during physical, mental, and emotional adversity. 
and it's often the mental and emotional adversity where you really see actual toughness and like toughness isn't yelling at the ref toughness isn't getting a red card that's not toughness for how we define it it's staying dialed into the into the moment of the game um so it's something that you know we we try to train we try to work on we try to create moments of shared adversity where our guys are going to have to be tough to uh, succeed in those moments and um you know i i think those were the competition and toughness was kind of what i brought with me the the need that i saw within the program but the brotherhood and the hard work you know i think we had that from day one um how, how how big of a deal is for you to get the player buy-in or is that still a work in progress or do you think the 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 team is is all bought in and and is ready for climbing the mountain yeah yeah so and again one of the things afforded by the disruption of covid is just like we went through a year of training without you know, competition, like real mm -hmm. kind of competitive matches. And so it, you know, it wasn't a situation where I had to come in and kind of make roster decisions right away mm -hmm. based on buy. It was a way sure. like to organically kind of sort out who's going to fit the, the, the culture, who's going to really be about it and who's not. And, you know, it was kind of, um, it was a self-selection process for guys like the guys that remained yeah really bought in guys they're they're about the trajectory of the program and and that's natural and it was natural also to to lose a got a lot of guys um yeah. and and to be able to then recruit guys that kind of fit the the style of play vision to yeah. that fit the cultural vision as well um no i think everyone that's part of the team is is bought in yeah. um and you know one thing that we believe about teammates like we kind of type them as three types of team there's three types of teammates out there you know there's there's force multipliers so like anyway, like the glue guys the guys that come in they share they bring energy they share energy there's pulses yeah. there's guys that you know they bring energy maybe they're not comfortable yet sharing energy and we work with them we mm -hmm. teach them different ways um, yeah. within their personality types to share energy. And then, you know, every person that's been a part of a team has recognized uh, the third type, which is vampire. Someone yeah. that's going to suck it away energy it from the up. group. <laughs> it doesn't give yeah. anything. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, as, as a program, like our culture is at a point that we don't accept vampires like mm -hmm. recruiting process our core values and our standards are at the forefront and a lot of my recruiting process is talking about who isn't a good fit to families and yeah. asking players to really reflect because you know like how i think about it is yeah like i believe that the player you know what i've heard what i've seen the evidence i have in front of me you know, when I offer a spot to the player, I, I, I normally will, will tell them like, Hey, I be believe you could do this. I wouldn't be offering you the spot if I didn't believe you could do this and succeed here. But there's only one person in the conversation that knows for sure. And that's, yeah. that's the player. And so I always ask them to make that decision to like reflect on it and to be real with themselves and to be real with me. Like, if you don't think you could do this for four years, like you don't have to please me, right? Like it's going to be a bad fit ultimately. And, yeah. um, so we really try to put that at the forefront of our recruiting process. Um, mm -hmm. and to make sure that the guys that are coming in are aligned with the vision. Mm -hmm. Oh, very good. Um, so that's you've had a couple of years doing that now. Is that are you? Is it starting to materialize in terms of the kids you're bringing in? Do you, do you? Yeah. Yeah. No, I. You know, I, I was really proud. Like, listen, you know, outcomes are always outcomes. I, I was really proud of what we accomplished last year, mm -hmm. which included kind of like my first, what I would consider my first full recruiting class. Right. Um. You know, 
like I was happy with some of the guys we, we were able to kind of get into the program with that truncated recruiting class during COVID, yeah. like got some really nice um, additions to the team there. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I do like in terms of living our core values, in terms mm-hmm. of living our standards, in terms of how we approach training, how we approach matches, in terms of, you know, I, I've used the analogy of like going up the mountain. Another way to think of it is, you know, Juniata historically has been a program that has lost big, right? Mm-hmm. You know, like if you kind of like look at the, the history of it, right? Like, and you actually analyze the games closely, you know, a lot of clear cut chances against, very few clear cut chances created. Um, no matter what the score was right. and you know this past season i felt like we were a team that lost small yeah you know yeah. like we won yeah. some games we tied some games and in the games that we lost by and large in terms of clear cut chances we lost you small were, you were at least in it or at least you yeah. gave yourself the opportunity to be in it yeah. yeah and then so you know the next step is win small right yeah. and then ideally the last step is you win big, big yeah. um so i feel that we're kind of in the lose small space and now we're moving to the wind small mm-hmm. will it happen next year hey like i i really hope so <laughs> but you know like i also have kind of seen the process play out before at swarthmore mm-hmm. um we had to rebuild when i was a coach there yeah. we went through a rebuild process and you know so really have confidence in the process that hey it might happen next year but it might be the year after that but it will happen yeah. Um, that's kind of the, the mindset that we're taking yeah, and just yeah. trying to focus on that. Yeah. Progress, not perfection, right? Like that's what yeah. you're looking for. If it's a step back, then there's a problem, right? And it's just, are you, are you making these incremental improvements yeah. to, uh, over time? Hey, off the beaten path, I'm <clears throat> just, um, I'm sure you, you're aware of the, rule changes the d3 any thoughts on those the substitution rules in the second half and yeah and you know so no that's a really good question um what i what i've thought a bit about like you know i had to like vote on it Uh, i was kind of in favor of both changes i don't think Mm -hmm. the substitution that got tabled yeah so yeah not, that got tabled the ot yeah. one went through the you know the no golden goal no ot during the regular season yeah so you know how i view the substitution the substitution rule is will it have um a drastic impact on the game I, i'm not convinced of that like mm-hmm. i i think it could nudge the game towards more theoretically more kind of possession based soccer mm-hmm. less frenetic yeah um it could definitely nudge it right but you know i think like style play a lot of the times it's going to be derived by um you know it's it gets derived by a lot of factors but you know mm-hmm. coaches have a, a real kind of part to play in that process Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, the rule could nudge coaches towards thinking that way, uh, thinking a little differently about it, but in all honesty, I don't know how much of a drastic impact it would have had. I think it, you know, definitely it would make substitution more strategic in the second half, which would have been cool. Um, Mm -hmm. and, and we'll see, I, you know, I, I think it will probably eventually pass. Um, but you know, I think we could have a much more of a substantive like change in the game. You know, like I'm realistic. I don't think division three is ever going to go to the full year model. Yeah. yeah. Like I, I'm realistic to that. I know what Mm -hmm. department budgets are. It's just never going to happen. But, you know, if we could have more training sessions in the spring, maybe a couple more play dates in the spring, I think the quality of play can improve if, yeah. if we had that. Um, in terms of overtime, you know, at, at one point we went like three straight overtime matches in a row. Mm-hmm. And, and I saw kind of like the impact on our, our fatigue levels and, mm-hmm. 
you know, so like I, I'm definitely okay with that. Will it increase ties? Yes, but like it's soccer. Like ties are okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. like yeah, it, it's it it just kind of got Americanized in, yeah. in NCAA. But yeah. um, so yeah, I'm you know I'm okay with both rule mm-hmm. changes. I, I I think there's other things that could happen if the intent is to like really improve the product mm-hmm. on the field. Um, but it's always good that, yeah, it could be like you were saying before, you know, progress is good. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, I, I always wondered too, is it possible? Okay. Maybe not go into the spring, but is there room to make the season longer in the fall? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, is it, can, again, budgets, all that kind of stuff. I, I don't have those problems right yeah. like those aren't issues i have to deal with but like is it possible to say okay you know it, your camp starts august 1st i'm making updates but august 1st your first games start the 15th you play you know i don't know once a week and then occasionally you're playing twice a week and then you're still finishing at the national championship in whatever it was, December, the first week in December or whatever, right? Like, is it possible to do that? Because I think that alone would probably have a really big impact on the game, right? Like, if you just sort of said, we're not playing during the week. This, that's, or, or, like I said, just for the number of games you need, can you, you know, you say, instead of playing every week, we're playing twice a week your you know every other week or however the math would work out yeah i I think that's a a great idea and Mm -hmm. you know i I, i'm always envious of spring sports and winter sports Mm -hmm. that you know they have objectively just more time with their athletes leading into seasons um so you know you could talk about what equity means right is it Mm -hmm is it the number of practices or is it, you know, if you do that, that increases the money spent on a sport, Mm -hmm. you know, so there's like different ways to define equity. Right. But if you're talking about just pure number of days we get to spend with our athletes, like, you know, I I definitely have that envy, (laughs) Um, (laughs) you know, (laughs) Um, but yeah, yeah, I think that'd be a great idea. And, And, you know, progress comes incrementally so even yeah, yeah i would yeah. take i would take a couple more days i would take yeah, yeah. uh just extending yeah, I mean, the it might, a couple it, more it, days it literally might only be that right maybe yeah. it's packing on an extra week yeah. at the front end right and then you're just sort of adjusting your calendar yeah. accordingly maybe that's all it's needed. i haven't looked at it i'm just thinking of this stuff right yeah. like maybe that's enough it's not it's not revolutionizing the way you know the programs are managed because you have the you're basically 10 months out of the year or you know whatever yeah but um that's why i'm not in those meetings and i don't have to do <laughs> like yeah. I, i'd be like oh, maybe something else we could do yeah i wouldn't be helpful yeah um hey hey I, i'm curious i'm I, I look at you as like one of the new guys right so and and new guy as in new guy new guy right because it's your first head coaching job and i and i get you have a you have the I mean, I know I'm sure COVID was this whole series of challenges and and then you had your first year. And I guess uh, I'm curious to know is, you know, as you're as you're shaping your program and building it out and you got the player buy in. How, how do you know? I guess I'm trying to figure out is like, what's the incremental steps that you make, right? Like, and when probably is the most important thing you said, you said, right. You historically Juniata has lost big last season. You lost small. Is this like, okay, now we're aiming for let's, let's win small. Yeah. Or is it Right. Like, are you making a conscious decision about that thing? Or are you just sort of focused in on I have to build out this program and then the outcomes, as you said, will come yeah. once we've done all this other stuff? Yeah, did no, that make definitely. Sense? That's a little ramble, but no, no, I, I, I hear what you're asking. I think I yeah. understand what you're asking. And and yeah, like, again, the out, outcomes will come from 
you know, it, like, here's how I thought about it, taking over the job is like, we needed to get better defensively kind of quickly, like how we pressed, how we competed, um, how we were organized defensively that immediately would have an impact on our competitiveness in tough mm-hmm. conference matches. Um, so, you know, we prioritize that, um, I'm a possession based coach. So I also wanted, you know, you're, you're working with kind of limited time. Um, so we wanted to have the ball, have a little bit more pattern in our play. Um, and to have a little bit more of that in our identity, kind of the mm-hmm. first year. Um, and, you know, each year in the recruiting cycle, we're, we're getting to bring in, you know, pieces, right. And, mm-hmm. You know, I think we're at the point like this spring, our main focus, we we continued working on pressing in different ways to press and make teams uncomfortable um, Mm -hmm. to throw sugar in the engine of our opponents. Right. And but then we focused a lot on how we how we build the game. Mm -hmm. Um, So a lot of times in the fall when we did build, I I felt like we still got sealed in our half. We weren't able to like. Mm -hmm really build into the opponent's half and just like right. take territory yeah, and, yeah. and maintain territory. Yeah. Um, so we worked on that a lot and, mm-hmm. you know, happy with some of the things we did in our, our spring play day, like how, how it looked and, you know, we'll, we'll continue that into the fall. Mm-hmm. Um, and that emphasis of, of really trying to build the game, build into the opponent's half and, and maintain, maintain mm-hmm. the territory. And then, you know, we need more cutting edge in kind of the final third. Um, and we worked a lot on our combination play in the final third, had some, some really nice moments again, but being able to do it consistently game after game. Um, and we're going to continue working on that and, you know, really excited about how some of the attacking players have been developing um, and like the work that they're going to, putting in the work they're going to put in this summer, you know, I have a feeling, um, kind of like I was saying, like, I don't know exactly when we'll completely flip as a program for Mm -hmm. us, but I'm confident that the program will flip. Same thing with some of our attacking players. I I don't know exactly when they're going to like become a eight goal guy or like a 10 goal guy, but I'm, I'm confident in a couple of the guys that it's going to happen for them if they keep doing what they're doing. Um, and, you know, we, we're also bringing in a pretty dynamic attacking player that I think is going to help us as well. Mm-hmm. And then, so there's all that. That's like kind of like big picture stuff. But I, I also spend a lot of time talking about thinking about the margins of the game. Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> you know, yeah. how quickly do you take in throw-ins? Yeah, yeah. Right. Like yeah. how like how do you set up throw ins in different areas of the field like mm-hmm. your set piece organization, uh, mm-hmm. defensive and attacking and um, how do you look on goal kicks? How do you look on pressing goal kicks mm-hmm. like those kind of those margin? Like how do you transition? How do you travel? Mm-hmm. So because um, yeah. it's often the margins of the game that will kind of dictate the, the winner, the loss, yeah. like how are you in your one V one moments attacking and defending? And, um, so, but like main priorities pressing how we build the game and, and just looking and trying to measure that over time and showing the guys the progress Mm -hmm. with how we measure that. Those are what I call the details. And I watch a lot. I'm the same way. I am like, I, I don't, not that I don't care, right? It interests me to see teams try to play possession, but I'm like, is it, I call it like faux possession and how yeah. deep are there's their understanding of the game, Yeah. right? Where it's interesting that you notice, oh, you can, you can knock it around in the back, but you yeah. struggle once you get forward to maintain possession, right? Like, that's what I look, I look at that, right? Yeah. I don't look at the back three knocking it around like that's a snoozer for me it's like yep. everybody does that and it's not and yeah. then i look beyond that and i'm like yeah what do they do on throw-ins like because if if you're detailed and you're focused in on those little moments 
those matter, right? Like, are you just sort of winging it or, and, or going so slow if you're not killing time? Like, that's where you, to me, those are like the advantages, the unquantifiable advantages that you give yourself when you're focused in on that moment. So your throw-ins, your set pieces, your runs, your traps, those little things sort of are the things that stand out to me. Like, that's a team, you know? Mm -hmm. Like that's they got it going on. Whatever the score is, I don't care at that point, right? It's, yeah. Again, it's no sweat off my back. But hey, what's your what's your normal practice look like? Yeah, if there is such a thing during the fall, <laughs> like it's yeah. like recovery or <laughs> right. yeah, yeah. Like <laughs> so. So what I would say is, you know, I like. I, I try to keep it pretty like I believe every single second on the field matters. We we get so mm -hmm. little time with our guys yeah. that you know I'll send out the training session normally early in the afternoon so the guys have the whole picture of the practice. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll always have the scoreboard on the clock on. Mm -hmm. Um and of course, you know there's going to be variation if we don't if we're not getting what we need out of an exercise, right, we may mm -hmm. go a little bit longer to make sure that we get it before we move on. Mm -hmm. But trying to have a, a training session really organized and time stamped, um, mm -hmm. you know, some some I'm a big believer in, you know, if you have you know, any coach could go on YouTube and have like infinite amount of exercises right like mm -hmm. <laughs> and you know i think it's it could be a mistake right if you're just like well i want to try this because byron tried it you know like like <laughs> and and so just having core and like listen i think you you need to adapt you need to always study the game you need to tr try to continue to progress as a coach but it's it has to be done in kind of a systematic way yeah. you need to have your core exercises um that you've gained mastery in as a coach and you could teach really really well from those exercises so um you know there's a number of, like every session will have rondos um yeah. Yeah, every session uh normally will have like some sort of uh passing pattern or, or choreography to it mm -hmm. um you know, we'll work on pressing choreography. We'll work yeah. on um, how we move in kind of the big picture. And and then, you know, there's just game-based training, like mm -hmm. things with conditions that I really like as a coach that mm -hmm. um, we'll have. And, you know, I, I try to, like, we, we got to cover a lot of ground. Of course, set-piece training, like doing some yeah. set-piece work, uh, trying to do a little bit every day rather than, the day before the game, like doing a 45 minute, like giant overview, like trying to do a little bit incrementally. Yeah. Um, and, you know, at different points in the season, like it, it becomes beneficial to like break into functional groups um, mm -hmm. because you could kind of con control the intensity and allow mm -hmm. for recovery while you're still getting tactical concepts mm -hmm. across. Um, but yeah, I would say there's probably like 15 core exercises that mm -hmm. we will kind of repeat in different cycles throughout the year. Mm -hmm. uh, the spring is when I like to kind of experiment and teach um, yeah. some new stuff that I want to try out. And then that kind of gets incorporated into the fall. Mm -hmm. And and then we go again in, in the spring, try to incorporate a couple new things, see, mm -hmm. uh, see how it goes and kind of adjust. But um, that's how I kind of think about how I work. Um, yeah. And, you know, you get into the season, very rarely can you just have, like, you know, your topic with capital letters, we are only working on pressing, right? Like, yeah. you're working on pressing, but the subtopic is build up. Yeah, yeah. And you're still paying attention to transition. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, you want kind of the core topic to come through. Yeah, yeah. Do you, I, I'm curious, do you do, do you, do you have, um, um, do you do two a days in the fall? It, is that not a thing anymore? Um, so definitely during preseason and then, mm -hmm. 
you know, like we we do like extra finishing work. Um, and yeah, I think I think there's an opportunity just by functional group to do that. Yeah. It, it wasn't something we did this past fall, but it's something that I've been thinking yeah. about scheduling wise, the yeah. kind of logistics around scheduling to yeah. to get a little bit more like a quick, short, functional session at some yeah. point during the day. All my forwards. I want my forwards today. Yep. I want my midfielders yep. today. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I think I, I see a huge benefit in that, mm-hmm. like just a smaller group that you can mm-hmm. kind of work with and, and really hone in on. So you're, it's interesting because you're sort of, again, you're building, right? And you're trying to climb the mountain and, and, and doing the things I mean, do do you see it? Have you encountered any? I'm sure you have. Aside from the big one, the COVID thing, have you have you had any like challenges that have really sort of materialized over the last year for you? Yeah. In terms of in, in not not so much like you know. You know, Johnny got in trouble, right? Yeah. Like, and so <laughs> academic. Oh, he's struggling yeah. academically. Not those, but but more in terms of where you want to take the program. Yeah, you know, I think in life, like, I think it's a generally true maxim, right? Like, we're all impatient. We all want <laughs> things to happen faster than they're going to happen, right? And you know, I I think just. You know, one of the things that I had to learn just as even as a assistant coach at, at Swarthmore is like, yeah, there's it's a cliche, but trying to be even keeled and mm-hmm. and recognizing, you know, there are times where, um, you know, say I'd be frustrated with a performance. And then I think about it, like, you know, what, the guys I'm front like some of them are rookies and maybe they're not going to be the most consistent performer right now, yeah. but you know, they're doing the right things. They're, they're performing really well for as rookies and just kind of, you know, just reminding my, myself, keeping an even keel mm-hmm. in the process. Um, and which is not the easiest thing to do in a game. That's just full of emotion, right? Yeah. <laughs> like it, yeah. 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 Hey, let me know. pick the hardest thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Incredibly, incredibly difficult. Right. And yeah easier easier said than done but yeah. i think as a coach it's important to have routines when you lose as a team it's important to have routines when you win it's important to have routines and, and the traditions and routines they they help you keep you stable in the in the process and what i was proud about you know i thought it was like a real kind of test of of the culture mm-hmm. there are moments in the season when it was really kind of going going against us, it would have been easy for guys to fracture. It would have been easy for guys to get a, get selfish, easy, um, for guys to start blaming each other and making excuses. Mm -hmm. And, and of course, you know, you're going to have little moments, little fires, but like by and large, the team really stuck together. And, Mm -hmm. and that for me was like the most important thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Let me ask you, and this is a political question, which probably will get you in trouble, but you know, I'll, <laughs> I'll still ask it if you don't want to, if you don't want to answer, right. that's fine. Like, um, with you coming on board in 2020, was that, is there something at Juniata, whether it's the AD or, or the administration or something that's saying, you know, we want our athletics to be better. Mm-hmm. Right? And and you're just one of those pieces of the puzzle, or is it just me sort of making things up in my own head? And I'm okay if it's just me making things up in my own head, but... No, I, I, I do think... Um, yeah, there's a, there's a recognition of the possibility for Juniata mm-hmm. to... And, and you look at it, like we have the top some of the top volleyball programs in the country just like yeah. i didn't know this fact well women's volleyball has won 40 straight conference championships like absolutely oh like God. a 
beyond yep. uh, a messiah in men's soccer, right? Yeah, like, yeah, uh, yeah. Well, I didn't... Holy yeah, God. so, you know, I... And, you know, in, in what I would say is, uh, like, I, I got to meet the president, obviously meet the AD, and... Mm -hmm. And in analyzing a job, I wanted the ambition of the school to match my own ambition, right? Yeah, yeah. And um, I wouldn't have taken the job if there was an ambition to be better. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So that's kind of how I would I would put it. Um, I, I I'm I mean you have some great facilities, right? Like that to me is sort of. For a longest time was the demonstration of commitment by a school mm -hmm. was how good the facilities was. And you saw programs sort of, hey, we're going to have our own soccer field, our own soccer stadium. I, I mean, I'm thinking Ohio Wesleyan and, yeah, you know, the J. Martin Complex, which was there when I was playing, right? And that's cool. years ago. And then, you know, Messiah and I was up to Tufts and all these different places that have a you know, a real commitment and they're like showing it by, Hey, let's have some real facilities. And I look at you guys, just pictures online. I've never been, mm -hmm. I'd like to one of these days, but, um, like that's pretty remarkable what you have. I mean, just, yeah. and I, I wonder if kids realize that, but that's a whole other discussion. But, um, and, and then the other thing I know, again, coming from where I graduated from, which is the university of Mount union, right division three or not successful athletics matters mm -hmm. right schools benefit greatly when their athletics are really good and university of mount union with football dramatically different school when i went there to what it is now and that's all because of they i want to say they you know they put all their chips on athletics but largely athletics drove its notoriety and all that stuff anyhow yeah. that's I'm, I'm on a soapbox so you're what 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 are you thinking about the fall like what what are you are you there yet mentally about thinking about some of the things that you want to happen like are you already like hey i want to make the conference tournament or or do you think that's that might be a little premature and and just an annoying question by somebody who's on the outside like hey no like, no it's and it's I think it's important. Well, part of being even keeled is recognizing that as coaches, we're really optimistic people mm -hmm. <laughs> and the, and the most wildly optimistic is like going into preseason, right? Like everyone yeah, yeah, is, yeah. you know, like yeah. that, that experience there of, uh, doing that. But again, you ground yourself in the process. You ground yourself mm -hmm. in what are the things that we actually need to get better at that yeah. are going to, do it. I, I want us to create more clear cut chances. That's going to be mm -hmm. something that I'm measuring. I want us to build into the opponent's half with more regularity and then maintaining mm -hmm. possession while we're there. That's going to be measured. And I'm confident that we're going to be able to get better in those things mm -hmm. and in getting better in those things. Um, you know, I, I think we've been going about the recruiting process the right way. We, mm -hmm. we have some guys coming in that you know, the, they'll help us and guys that are developing it within the team that mm -hmm. will help us. And, um, but yeah, I'm a, I'm a very competitive guy. Um, the vision here is championships. The vision is yeah. championships. And, yeah, yeah. um, you know, so uh, I'm excited. I'm excited for the fall. I think, yeah. um, we're, we're poised to, to step forward. We're poised to, I think, I see a lot of parody in the landmark mm -hmm. conference. Yeah. Um, so really kind of try to put ourselves in that, in that bloodbath in the yeah. two through six <laughs> range. Right. And just yeah. roll up our sleeves and really fight yeah. there. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, I, I think that's kind of the, the realistic goal and you're in that yeah. two for six range. In some years you'll make the playoffs some years, you know, and then yeah, obviously yeah, you yeah. want to try to get into that, yeah. you know, one to three range. Um, yeah. I don't think style, style of play in the landmark, I don't think there's a dramatic difference between one and, yeah. you know, I, I just, it, it, it's key pieces to me, right? Like there's one or two special players that 
make a difference that other teams don't have. Yeah. Um, um, hey, here's something you mentioned about um, measuring and that you're measuring uh, um, like your, uh, I guess I'll say chances created or opportunities in front of goal. Like, is that something, is that literal or is that where, or do you literally try to f- count or figure out how many practice to practice game by game that of opportunities that you, you create? Yeah. So, you know, each time when we're breaking down video, mm-hmm. like, cause shots only tell so much of a story, right? You can yeah. look at like, it's a real, very yeah. a rudimentary statistic. Mm-hmm. Like you could be outshot, but a team is just making terrible decisions on like, you know, they're like ripping shots from like 30 yards yeah. out. Um, but yeah, I, I, I try to analyze clear cut chances, you know, I'm not doing it at like an absolutely objective level. Like yeah. there is subjectivity in terms of like what I consider clear cut versus not clear cut. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. I'm not doing like true expected goal calculations. Right. Mm-hmm. But yeah, looking at chances like where uh, at a baseline, you know, you're, you're within the 18 and you you have like a an uninterrupted shot on goal yeah. right like are you taking it yeah yeah yeah, yeah like yeah. just kind of defining those um yeah those moments for the opponent and in, in like mm-hmm. you know each game like yeah we'll have like passing sequence kind of breakdowns mm-hmm. um trying to pinpoint like okay good pressing moments good transition mm-hmm. moments good set piece moments. Um, Mm -hmm. but we're always marking out clear cut chances created and conceded. Yeah. And trying to get a tally each match. Um, I'm lucky. I have a fantastic student manager that he Mm -hmm. does. Like I'll give him. normally I'll focus kind of the stat gathering on kind of like specific specific topics, but he's taking stats like during training and we could kind of give the guys some, some objective feedback at the end of training. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which is nice. Yeah, yeah. I always say, like, too, when it comes to stats, sometimes what you think you see in a game versus what the yeah. stats tell you is dramatically different. I, a lot of this exercise I do is about me convincing myself that I'm my thoughts about the game are real or not real, right? <laughs> like, just yeah. based on things that I'm watching and I'm trying to... So, passing was a big one i did one on on scoring goals like where do goals come from um just to understand better and do i have a good sense do i am i watching the way the game is actually playing or am i watching it um yeah and it, yeah it's like tumbling at times as a coach right yeah yeah because immediately after a match you will have a perception and I, I try to Absolutely. be pretty careful about what I say immediately after yeah. a match. Um, yeah. I want to, you know, make sure that I'm on firm ground and, and whenever <laughs> I'm presenting a message to the team. Yeah. Right. And, you know, it, like watching video the next day wow. and it's, yeah, it's part of the process of recovery after a win or after a loss. Yeah. It's like really closely analyzing video the yeah. next day and, yeah. and breaking it down. Um, so, yeah. Hey, just shifting over to, um, recruiting the, someone asked, um, on the D3 soccer.com boards about those, you know, those, there's those recruiting companies out there that supposedly help for a fee to help play students or get coaches interested in students do you use those as part of your recruiting process or a more yeah. it's a more curious question i don't you know, yeah don't yeah begrudge I, people making money so like i i will fish in any pond that's kind of my <laughs> mindset as a recruiter so you know if i get an email from a company that has video myself or my assistant is going to watch that video so mm. it, can, it can serve as an introduction but mm. then we're going to do the light work to find out more, see more, put them through our full process that really yeah. takes in, you know, their personality type. And, and we really try to get to know the families and the, and the players in the mm. process. And that takes time. Um, 
will I ever recruit a player because someone I don't know tells me to recruit a player? No, absolutely not. You know, like Mm -hmm. even, even guys that I know really well that I trust, like, yeah, that gets me really alert to a player. Yeah. Um, it gets me moving probably a little quicker towards that player, but we're going to do our homework. That's our job. Do our, do our homework. Um, you know, I think, yeah. And so I, Probably not all those companies are created equal. I don't know the market yeah. that well. Um, nah, I, I do. I do think like I know Mark Wagner, who used to be the Eastern head coach, mm-hmm. has kind of like started some in that mm-hmm. field. Not where they're like, you know, like playing agent and like contacting mm-hmm. coaches, but just kind of like a so- a pretty unique software that they've created uh-huh. yeah. um, that thinks a lot more about like kind of school fit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think that company is called athlete match and I know some of the guys involved there and there's people that I respect. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that's kind of my perspective on it. I'm going to fish in any pond. So if yeah, someone yeah, sends yeah. me an email, I, you know, we're going to read that email. We're going to yeah. see what the video is and, and kind yeah. of take it from there. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. The, I have no, like I said, I don't begrudge people making money. So it, yeah. it, to me, yeah. it's one. Right. If, if they figure out a formula to make a buck doing what they do and helping somebody find a school to yeah. play and all that kind of like if that works, great. I, I just don't know. Like you, I don't know enough of it. And I don't we get my sons have gotten those things that come in and I basically ignore them. I'm not I don't you know, I, to me, it's always better. I tell my sons to. You know, pick up the darn phone, send a video, send an email, do yeah. the hard work. Don't expect somebody else to do the hard work for you. So yeah. Um. Okay, so another another fun one. You know what? What are your thoughts on sh- these showcase tournaments that exist just about everywhere and are conceivably the bane of existence for every parent out there of a soccer player? All right. Yeah, you know, I and I didn't divulge any of my thinking on. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, and again, like not every showcase tournament is created equally, right? Yeah. And uh, that is we we get out a lot as a staff. Mm-hmm. We go mm-hmm. to a lot of. It is a, a primary vehicle for us to identify and evaluate players, mm-hmm. um, and you know, I think. You know the the downside is always a busy day. We're getting snapshots of players, um, mm. and how we try to work our process is we're an early recruiting program, mm. and that affords us the time mm. to try to see players multiple times in the process. Mm. So if we watch a player at, um, you know, I don't know. I, I could say a million showcase, right? But yeah. if we watch a player <laughs> in Bethesda, we're going to try to see him yeah. play again at Jeff Cup, right? Yeah, and, yeah. Um, and having that that kind of follow-up, trying to be thorough, you know, and, and just, yeah, recognizing that sometimes we're going to have to make decisions on evaluations with imperfect information. That's mm-hmm. yeah, that's part of the job, too, mm-hmm. and... And what's important in those moments, like trusting our instincts. Mm -hmm. And what I would also say is really important for our evaluation because we know evaluation, you know, it could could be imperfect, right? Like really trying to get to know personalities, Mm -hmm. having a lot of phone calls, Zooms, you know, like running a very thorough recruiting process Mm -hmm. um, where we're communicating our values and and really trying to guide a family through the process is Mm. important for us because ultimately um at our level a lot is going to depend on someone's mindset towards development like their their willingness to really um hone in on their weaknesses like accentuate their strengths over time to set specific goals and really attack those goals Mm. um so we we try to really focus on that side of things like getting to know people in a in a kind of deeper meaningful way in the recruiting process yeah yeah i do i definitely is like it's a process it's not a 
destination, right? I think a lot of kids do take it that way that, hey, I'm going to play at Juniata when no, it's it's not, you're not, right? You're going in there to be part of a team, to become a better player, and then your reward, if you do all of those things, is to play, right? Like, you, so there's a whole series of things to do. Um Right. Do you do do you have an ID camp or ID um, camps? So we we didn't during COVID. Like my assistant mm-hmm. and I are, are kicking around some dates. We we probably will uh, stand something up this summer. Yeah. Um, and we're both gonna be like, there's my perspective on camps. I I really I try to attend camps where I actually get to coach. And uh-huh. actually get to work with players. That that's kind of yeah. my preference. Uh-huh. I don't want to just go and and evaluate. Watch. Yeah, yeah. Like I I think that coaching someone is actually a great evaluative, you know, like uh-huh. tool. Like it's yeah. Um, so you know we'll be at we'll be at Penn's can't. I think they do a really good job. And yeah, uh, Elite Three Hundred is kind of a, a yeah. camp associated with Swarthmore, so we'll be back, yeah. back there and. Yeah. And, um, so, but yeah, we are, we are in the work. We're trying to figure out like a good time to stand oh. something up so we could oh, yeah. like really kind of evaluate guys within probably like a two and a half, three hour radius. What radius. I, what I will say is, um, I believe in evaluating, going out, doing my job, evaluating players. If I've evaluated players, I'm not going to then, and I have like a strong evaluation. I'm not going to then make them go to a camp just to make them go to a camp. Yeah, like, camp, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I do think, <laughs> yeah, that does happen in our profession. But, um, yeah. To where, yeah. There's, and and like, mean, you know, I think some coaches really use it as like the final test, the final evaluation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, where they bring in a lot of really good players and they see who rises to the top in mm-hmm. that environment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I just don't think we're at a place to really run that type of camp. So yeah. um, I'm going to use it as kind of a, yeah, ability to analyze local talent that mm-hmm. it honestly is probably not really seen that much in the, yeah. this, this kind of area and, and try to yeah. give give the players in this area like a pretty good soccer experience that's yeah. that's how we're looking at it that that actually makes sense right like just doing it for this area like the circumference around juniata like okay yeah. how can we how can we sort of bring in players in that in that area that might otherwise not get the opportunity we might not get the opportunity to see yeah hey do you what are your thoughts on the high school game on yeah. high school soccer yeah, good. You know, good question. I I think, um, yeah, there's there's something to be said for it. I in terms of recruiting efficiency, I'm not out at many yeah. high school matches. Yeah. I I do like to attend some like state finals. I like mm-hmm. to see kind of how guys that we know about are responding in that type of environment where yeah. there's normally a lot of fans there. There's Huge There's emotion. kind of like, a, yeah, yeah, like heightened emotions around the game yeah. and seeing how players like deal with that environment. Mm. Um, I think, you know, it depends also on the area, right? Like, yeah. there, there's some areas where high school soccer is still a really, there's just like strong tradition programs yeah. Yeah. that are still producing really good players. Yeah. Of course, you know, you have kind of like the Northeast prep school circuit that oh, really yeah. does a good yeah. job um, producing some some quality players and, and they're doing a good job of like creating showcases. Yeah. So college coaches will go and, and see their players. Um, and yeah, so, you know, like, again, I'm going to fish in every pond, yeah. like. Yeah. We're going to recruit MLS next players. We're going to recruit ECNL players. We're going to recruit yeah. national league players. We're going to recruit like, uh, you know, some of the guys that wherever it leads. Yeah. Right? Wherever. Yeah. It's like when I play, when my playing days, like have game will travel, you know, yeah. like that was it. Like, yeah. okay, I'm going. 
You know? It's like same with the looking for, for players, I would gather. So uh, can you talk a little bit about your recruiting class and what, h- how it's gone and, and, and sort of who you, some kids that, that are coming through, what, what your overall thinking is? You don't have to name names if you're not comfortable with it, but just, yeah. just your overall impression, especially taking into consideration where you're trying to get to, right? Yeah, you know, like I was saying, I, I really think that we, we just got a gem of a person first and foremost. But we, mm-hmm. um, there's a player coming in that I think is going to be. We project out very highly over mm-hmm. the course of his career as an attacking player, which is really meeting a need within the team. Mm-hmm. Um, and <laughs> yeah, the player is just ambitious and hungry, mm-hmm. and I think was missed in the recruiting process right play for like that high profile of a club played uh-huh. multiple sports and and kind of got missed in the process so really excited and yeah i think you know we get we try to recruit you know pennsylvania is a soccer rich state so yeah. you know kind of cover our bases in pittsburgh and philly area and mm-hmm. in kind of lancaster central pa area mm-hmm. and we have guys coming from every one of those areas Mm-hmm. Um, but we also, you know, we recruit, um, nationally. So, uh, we got a guy coming in from Mississippi, which is cool. Wow. My, my first time, uh, getting a guy out of Mississippi and uh-huh. like again, but how um, did you find, can I ask you, especially like, how did you find him? Yeah. So that, that one was, uh, you know, the value of, of kind of camps, like some ads, uh-huh. He actually attended Elite 300, and then he attended Penn's camp. So, like, both uh-huh. – I got to see him twice at camp, twice. which was cool. Yeah. And I actually got to coach him at Penn's camp. Mm-hmm. Um, and just, yeah, really liked yeah. his personality and, and saw a lot of potential in his, mm-hmm. in his ability. Um, so, yeah, like, <laughs> I don't know. I, I think it's going to be a really, you know, like, kind of – going back to what we were talking about at the beginning of the conversation, I think we're adding like players into the environment where it's going to be really, really competitive in preseason. Um, And we have 10 guys coming in. So um, that will kind of like fill up our roster to 32 guys, exactly where we want it. And you know, some positions is going to be a bit of a bloodbath. <laughs> like it's going to yeah, be yeah, very, yeah. very, very competitive in those positions. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so, you know, we're excited about the depth and quality of the class. We were really excited about this past year's class where we had guys contribute significantly as rookies. Uh-huh. We had the rookie of the year in the conference. Uh-huh. Um, so I'm hoping that we have another rookie of the year in the conference and, and guys that could, uh, and a player of the year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you're, you know. if you're asking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, um, I was, I had a question that literally just left out. Uh, oh, I forget it. All right. Um, how, do you do you use do you show off your facilities to players? I'm I'm just curious about that. It's like do you I mean you you have a neat stadium. I mean mm-hmm. some great facilities, really pristine up there. Like yeah. is that is that a recruiting point for you or or not really? Yeah, abs- so I I put it like this. Like you know, again, kind of going back to reasons I was attracted to the job, like, yeah, it stood out to me for the reason that Mm -hmm. you were talking about, right? It showed, Mm -hmm. you know, a commitment to the program, right? Like a financial investment in the program. Um, In the recruiting process, yeah, like, yeah, we definitely showcase it. We talk about it. But I would say what I would say is this, if if I had a sense that a recruit was going to be making decisions based solely on facilities. Oh, yeah. He'd be yeah. a terrible fit for me as a <laughs> as a put <player>. like, just <laughs> would absolutely terrible. Fit. And like, you know, I'm I'm a guy not afraid to like say that in the in the process. <laughs> right. Like and, you know, I'll, I'll talk about listen, we have nice facility. I feel like we have everything we need here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we've been afforded that. Um, 
but I also I don't think it should be in your top three reason. I think it it could play a part in you making a decision, but I don't think it should sure. be in like kind of sure. your top three right reasons for making this decision and yeah. you know trying to emphasize that it's about people it's about relationships yeah. Yeah, yeah. with your professors with your teammates and with me like yeah. like yeah. so um that, that's kind of how i view it like yeah if it, yeah it's great we as coaches we always want better and better facilities yeah. there's a bit of an arms race going on in terms sure. of and that's that, that's so, why I ask, right? Like, yeah. it, there is a bit of an arms race, I think. And, uh, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know if I should say that. Like, sometimes if I hear a coach complaining too much about facilities, like, and and yeah. that that's not the reason you're rec- losing recruiting battles Recruit, yeah. over and over. You know, like, you may lose a couple battles like that, but yeah, that's not the reason you're losing recruiting battles. No. No, there's something I, that I agree with. That yeah. that I agree with. I just, to me, it's icing on the cake. Yeah, you yeah. know, like, hey, and of all of this other stuff that you're going to get, look where you get to play. I, yeah. I think that, absolutely yeah. in that regard, I think that's that's where it's valued at. Yeah, or that's the way I would look at it. Yeah, and right. we kind of talk because, about it in terms of like, yeah, community, right? Like yeah. the people yeah. that are going to be in the stands, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. Who shows up to the games? Like other yeah. athletes, professors, your fan, like yeah. Yeah. kind of bringing it back to community. Yeah, yeah. Um, hey, just just out of curiosity, what what when you're in your evaluations of players, and this is the last question. I'll I'll let you have the I'll let you have the, your the, your your life back <laughs> for the day. Um, what. You know the the players you recruit. Like, what what do you think they they lack as players in the college game? Knowing that they're going to come to college, and then part of the process is them getting acclimated and learning the things that they are lacking. Yeah, you know, good good question, and you know, I I think <laughs> you can make the argument at at pretty much every level, maybe at division one, some at the top programs, division one, you're getting more complete players yeah. that if, if you're thinking of evaluation as technical, tactical, um, athleticism and psychological, right? Like, um, you're getting guys that are, are checking boxes in all of those facets. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I think at our level, yeah, you're you're getting players that are checking boxes in a couple of those assets and uh, yeah. or aspects, but not all of them. And then mm. that's why we put such a focus on kind of the psychological piece, yeah. right? Like, what someone's growth mindset? What what is their mindset towards the game? Yeah. Um. You know, there's players that like the game. There's players that love the game. There's players that live the game, and. Yeah. To play for me, you have to at least love the game. I'm gonna, yeah. I'm gonna push you. I'm gonna teach you to live the game. Um, yeah. yeah. If you don't truly love, you know, like again, it's not, you're <laughs> not gonna be a great fit, right? But yeah. um, more generally speaking, you know, I think, and it's probably often said of um, coaches, right? Like uh, the college learning curve is a lot of times like defensively yeah. is. Uh, uh, I feel sometimes doesn't get emphasized enough in, in kind of a player's trajectory and development. And, and, and then, yeah, like, um, you know, we do, we do a, a lot of work on the, the technical side of things um, with the knowledge that you could sharpen technique of players. You could, you could push them along technically but you're also you're gonna live with the technical limitations of what you bring in, right? Like, bring in, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, there's only I too like there's only so much you can improve a player technically over the time that you have. Yeah. Not to say that they won't get better, but there's a limit, I think. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and you know it, it really takes guys putting in time outside yeah. of their outside of it. Yep. Totally agree. So identifying the guys that do that, right? Like that's, 
again, I, I keep coming back to that because I, I think it's so important is identifying yeah. guys that you could really see that will, you know, like we have a racquetball room. Yeah. You know, we have a, a number of guys within the team that they, they go live down there during the winter. Yeah. Like they're just, yeah. um, and like you do see sharpness, you do see jumps. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah, that that's how I think about it. And, yeah. but that's what makes the job fun is like you get to like work with guys like yeah. you get to help them set specific realistic goals yeah. work on those goals prioritize those goals and over time develop as players as people yeah yeah that's a real joy to the job yeah all right coach um usually what I'm gonna, I do is I just put like links and stuff down in the description um and how to get in touch with you and all that stuff. Um, uh, and if there's anything you want me to post, just let me know and I'll, I'll throw it in there as well. But just, just want to say thank you for taking the time today and, and knowing how uh, much in pain you must have been yesterday <laughs> when, when we were supposed to have yeah. this, although you bailed me out. But yeah. No, I, hey, I, I really enjoyed this conversation and, and yeah. it, this is a cool passion project. Like I, I really, uh, I got to watch some of the interviews and, and I really enjoyed them. So like, yeah, like happy to be a part of this. Oh, thank you. We're, we'll definitely catch up though before, beforehand, because I'm, you guys are on my radar now because I, I, like I mentioned earlier, look, l watching the best of the best and these consistently really good teams is fun. But I, I kind of like to see the ones like that are they're 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 trying they're tracking to progress right and yeah. how do they get better and I and I think there's a lot of there's a lot more potential out there to be for a lot of teams and yeah. and, and 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 with you on board um, at Juniata and and the commitment of the, of the of the school and everything you got going I think. You're you're definitely one of those. So I'll, I'll definitely be keeping an eye and and uh, we'll be watching some games. And maybe who knows? Maybe I'll be crazy enough, and my therapist will say, "Get it out of your <laughs> out of your system and go drive up there and watch a game." Maybe yeah, I'll come out of Huntington, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, why not? Why yeah. not? I've done uh, it is weirder things. It is beautiful out here. Beautiful out here yeah, so. yeah. Um, so yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So. Thanks again. Do appreciate it. And uh, we'll talk soon. All right. Have a good one, Steve. Yep.